Hi guys, so today we're going to be talking about rotating frames of reference. Any situation with circular motion can be considered in two ways. It can be considered from the frame of reference of an outside observer. Therefore, the object is always accelerating with the centripetal force towards the center of the circle. Or it can be considered from the frame of reference of an object in motion. So that object is at rest in its own frame of reference, and there's a fictitious centrifugal force which is directed outwards from the center of the circle. A centrifuge is a device that rapidly rotates. It's commonly used in the medical laboratory to separate substances by their density. Therefore, the more dense objects would sink to the bottom, and the less dense substances would rise to the top. This centrifuge simulates effects of gravity. The centrifugal force is a fictitious force in a rotating frame of reference. A rotating frame of reference is simply a type of non-inertial reference frame. Again, fictitious forces are apparent but non-existent forces. The centrifugal force is always directed outward from the center of the circle. Now in order to clarify, here's a free body diagram comparison between analyzing the same scenario from the Earth frame of reference versus the car, which is the moving object frame of reference. So let's say the car is making a turn, so the car would be turning right. If we were asked to draw the free body diagram of the driver, in the Earth frame of reference, the driver is accelerating. So we know that the force of the car on the driver, which is represented by F subscript CD, would be toward the center of the circle. Since that's the centripetal force. Note how this force is unbalanced, since there's no X component that counteracts it with the same magnitude. Of course, there's also the normal force acting straight upwards and then the gravitational force acting straight downwards. If we were to analyze the same scenario in the car's frame of reference, again, we have the normal force upwards, gravitational force downwards. We have that force of the car on the driver, which is towards the center of the circle. But this time, since it's a non-inertial reference frame, specifically a rotating reference frame, there's that fictitious force, which is the opposite direction of the centripetal acceleration force, which is the force of the car on the driver. So this centrifugal force is the same magnitude as that of the force of the car on the driver. But directed outward from the center of the circle. And that's why when you turn to the right in the rotating frame of reference, the driver feels as if he experienced a force in the opposite direction of the turn that he makes. Another force is Coriolis force. So Coriolis force is a fictitious force in the rotating frame of reference. Again, this is an apparent but non-existent force. This Coriolis force acts perpendicular to the velocity of the object in a rotating frame of reference. There's no examples of solving using this force in the textbook, and I never had any test questions based on this. So it definitely is not one of our main focuses in this section. So moving on to an example using centrifugal force. What is the centrifugal force experienced by a one kilogram object at the equator of the Earth's surface? How does this affect the object's apparent weight? So we know the mass of the object as well as the radius of Earth, which is given at the back of the textbook. We know the period of Earth to complete a full revolution is 24 hours, and converting that to SI units, which is seconds. And we're solving for normal force here, as well as fictitious force, which is the centrifugal force. So one of the formula variations for centripetal acceleration includes period, and that one is 4 pi squared r over t squared. Just plugging in the numbers which we already have, we can solve that that centripetal acceleration is 3.37 times 10 to the negative 2 meter per second squared towards the center of the circle. Now you can actually analyze this scenario again using either of the reference frames as explained previously. So the free body diagram of the mass from the star's frame of reference is just an example of an outside observer. So in this case, there's no fictitious force. There's only the normal force and the gravitational force, and we know that there's that centripetal acceleration. So we know centripetal acceleration is towards the center of the circle, and so that would be downwards, which is why we let downwards be positive. Solving for the net force in the y component, it's just fg minus fn through Newton's second law, f is equal to ma. In this case, a is centripetal acceleration, which we solved for above. Isolating for normal force, you get that it's equal to m times g minus a. Equivalently, if you were to solve this from the free body diagram of the mass from the moving frame of reference, so we know that there would be that normal force and gravitational force, but additionally, the object is at rest in its own reference frame. There's also that fictitious force that is directed outwards from the center of the circle, which is the centrifugal force. In this case, it would be upwards. 
So we know net force is equal to zero, which is equal to the gravitational force minus normal force minus fictitious force. Isolating for Fn, you get it's equal to mg minus the fictitious force. Both these scenarios should have normal force equal to the same thing regardless of what reference frame you observe it from. Therefore, we know that the fictitious force must be equal to ma. The reason for this is because you get the same result, Fn is equal to m times g minus a. So the normal force when plugging those numbers in is 9.8 newtons. If you were to solve for fictitious force, since we know that's equal to ma, 1 kilogram times that centripetal acceleration we saw for above is equal to 3.4 times 10 to the negative 2 newtons when rounding to 2 sig figs. Another important concept is artificial gravity. So circular motion can simulate Earth's gravity when it's rotating at a specific frequency. This is created when placing an object in a rotating frame of reference. Now moving on to an example of artificial gravity. So for a spaceship with a diameter of 1 kilometer, what period would be required in order to provide a simulation of Earth's normal gravitational field? So we know diameter, and we know that radius is half of diameter. There's a thousand meters in a kilometer, so we just divide that by two, and we get 5.0 times 10 to the two meters. And we're solving for period here. Now we're given in the question that we want Earth's normal gravitational field. So in order to feel the normal weight, Fn must equal to mg. Again, you can analyze this scenario from either an external frame of reference, or you can analyze it from the moving frame of reference. So I've drawn this scenario to the left in green, where the person is standing on this rotating space station. And at that point, which we're drawing the free body diagrams for, the person is upside down. So letting downwards be positive, since that will be the direction of centripetal acceleration, since it's towards the center of the circle once again. The free body diagram of the person from the star's frame of reference would just be the normal force downwards, since in space there's no gravity. So the net force would just be equal to the normal force, and since this is an inertial frame of reference, we know there's an acceleration. So mass times centripetal acceleration is equal to normal force, and we know normal force is equal to mg since we want to feel normal weight. The mass cancels on both sides since it's the same variable. Plugging in the formula for centripetal acceleration that includes period, and then isolating for period to solve, you get that the period is 45 seconds. You would get the same result if you were to solve from the other frame of reference, which is from the space station frame of reference. So the free body diagram of the person would be, again, that normal force downwards, but you would also have that fictitious centrifugal force directed outward from the center of the circle. The object, which is the person, is at rest in its own rotating frame of reference. So zero is equal to the normal force minus fictitious force. Again, normal force is equal to mg. The mass cancels since it's present on both sides, and then plugging in that formula for centripetal acceleration once again, and then isolating for t, period is equal to 45 seconds. It's a pretty short section, but now that we've covered all the theory and covered basic examples, we can move on to the Nelson textbook problems. So this is page 130, and we'll be covering number 1 to 3 and 6 to 8. Starting off with number one, when you swing a bucket full of water in a vertical circle at just the right speed, the water stays inside. Explain why. So the reason as to why the water stays inside can be explained from either of the frame of references. So from the bucket's frame of reference, which is the rotating non-inertial frame of reference, this is due to the centrifugal force, which is directed outward from the center of the circle, which is just enough to keep the water in the bucket. From Earth's frame of reference, which is the inertial frame of reference, this is due to inertia, which is the resistance to change its state of motion. Since the water and the bucket are traveling at the same velocity, the bucket and its contents maintain the same velocity and thus stay together. So from this frame of reference, you just apply Newton's first law. Moving on to question number two, explain how the spin cycle of a washing machine uses circular motion to remove water from clothes. The spin cycle of a washing machine uses circular motion to remove water from clothes because it creates a centrifugal acceleration. This forces the clothes to the outer wall of the washing machine and through the pores, thus removing excess water from the clothes. And this is observing it from the rotating frame of reference. Now for question number three. You're standing 2.7 meters from the center of a spinning merry-go-round holding one end of a string tied to a 120 gram mass. The merry-go-round has a period of 3.9 seconds. Part A says, draw a system diagram of the situation. So remember, a system diagram includes all elements of the scenario. There's the pole right in the center of the merry-go-round, and you're standing 2.7 meters from the center. 
and you're holding one end of that string and that mass is just hanging on the other end. For part B, it says draw a free body diagram of the mass in Earth's frame of reference. So we know this is an inertial frame of reference, so there's no fictitious force. There's only the tension force of the mass, which is diagonal since you're holding one end of the string of the mass. And that tension force makes an angle theta with the vertical. And then you have the gravitational force acting straight downwards. Part C says draw a free body diagram of the mass in the merry-go-round's rotating frame of reference. So from the rotating frame of reference, again, we still have that tension force, which is diagonally upwards, gravitational force, which is downwards, but this time we have that fictitious centrifugal force outwards from the center of the circle. Part D asks us, what angle does the string make with the vertical? So we're solving for theta. So I'm just going to use Earth's frame of reference, as there's no fictitious force, which makes it easier to solve, since there's only two forces. Letting upwards and toward the center of the circle, which is to the right in this case, be positive. Net force in the y component would be equal to zero since we know there's no acceleration in the y component. So zero is equal to the tension force's y component, which is related through the adjacent side, thus Ft cos theta, minus the gravitational force, which is mg. Isolating for tension, it just equal to mg over cos theta. Then solving for the net force in the x component, it just equal to the x component of the tension force. We know that's the opposite side, thus it's sine theta, and we also know there's an acceleration in the x component, which is the centripetal acceleration. So in the x component, it's equal to the centripetal force, which is m times the centripetal acceleration. Subbing in the tension formula that we just solved for using the y component, ft sine theta would be mg sine theta over cos theta, which is just mg tan theta. Mass is present on both sides, so you cancel that. Isolate for theta, and you get that theta is equal to 36 degrees. Part E asks us to determine the magnitude of the tension in the string. To do this, I just used that initial formula that we solved for, for tension, which is mg over cos theta. Plugging in that newly found theta value, you get the tension is 1.4 newtons. For question number 6, a space station has a radius of 100 meters. Part A asks us to determine the period of rotation required to provide an artificial gravity of g at the rim. So we know centripetal acceleration would be equal to g. We're solving for period, and we know the value for radius. Again, I'm just going to solve this from the external frame of reference, since this is simpler. There's only the normal force acting. If you recall from the scenario of the person standing on the space station, Again, let's just say the person was upside down at that point, so normal force would be acting downwards towards the center of the circle, so letting that be positive. The net force would be equal to m times ac, which is equal to the normal force. We know normal force would be equal to mg, since that's the normal weight. Canceling mass, since that's present on both sides, ac would be equal to g. Plugging in the formula variation of centripetal acceleration that includes period, we can isolate for period and then solve and get that the period required is 2.0 times 10 seconds. Note that there's two sig figs because we're assuming that the radius they gave us, which is 100 meters, would be exact. And if you look in part C, there's two sig figs. So for part B, it says at what speed is the rim moving? We know one of the formula variations for centripetal acceleration is v squared over r. So just isolating for speed there and solving by plugging those numbers in that we already know, speed is equal to 31 meter per second. Part C says, what is your apparent weight if you run along the rim at 4.2 meter per second opposite the rotation direction? Again, we know radius. We know initial speed to be the speed at which the rim is moving, which we just solved to be 31.3 meter per second. We were given that the speed at which you would be running would be 4.2 meter per second. The direction would be opposite that of the rotation speed. So letting v1, which is the rotation speed, be positive direction, we're solving for normal force. I'm just going to skip the analysis part of the free body diagram since it's super repetitive and it'd be the same free body diagram as drawn before. We know normal force is equal to the centripetal acceleration since we're observing this from an external frame of reference. Again, that would mean that normal force is equal to mv squared over r. In order to find overall speed, you would just add v1 and v2. Since you're running at 4.2 meter per second opposite the rotation direction, we know that by sign convention, since we let v1 be the positive direction, v2 would have to be negative. So v1 plus v2 would be 31.3 meter per second minus 4.2 meter per second. All of that is squared and you times it by mass divided by 100 meters. Since we weren't given mass, you can just keep that variable in. 
so the normal force would be 7.36 times mass. This would round to 7.4 times mass. For part D, it says what's your apparent weight if you run in the direction of rotation? So this time, again solving for normal force, except V2 is the same direction as V1. Instead of subtracting 4.2 from 31.3, now we're adding them since they're the same direction. Plugging those numbers in, you solve that the normal force is equal to 13 times mass. Part E asks, in which direction would you run to get the best workout, with or against the rotation? So you'd actually run with the direction of motion for the best workout because you'll note that the normal force is 13 times mass in the second scenario, whereas in the first scenario, it's 7.4 times mass. Since we know that normal force is equal to centripetal force, since this centripetal force is greater, we know that this would require the person to put in more effort, therefore leading to a better workout. Moving on to question number seven, an astronaut with a mass of 65 kilograms is in a rotating space station with a radius of 150 meters. She stands on a scale and the reading is 540 newtons. So we know mass and radius as well as normal force since that's what the scale reading represents. We're solving for centripetal acceleration here. Analyzing this from an external frame of reference, again, I'm just skipping the analysis since again, it's repetitive. So normal force is equal to the centripetal force. Isolating for AC, you get that the centripetal acceleration is 8.3 meter per second squared. For part B, calculate the speed of rotation of the outer rim of the space station. We know AC is equal to V squared over R. Isolating for speed, we get 35 meter per second. For part C, calculate the period of rotation of the space station. Again, using another formula variation of centripetal acceleration, it's just equal to 4 pi squared r over t squared. Isolating for period, you get 13 seconds. Last but not least, for question number 8, a centrifuge spins with a frequency of 1.1 times 10 to the 3 hertz. A particle in a test tube is positioned 3.4 centimeters from the center of the centrifuge. Part A asks, determine the acceleration of the particle at this position from Earth's frame of reference. So we know frequency and we know radius, and we're solving for centripetal acceleration. Since we're given all the information we need, using one of the formula variations of centripetal acceleration, 4 pi squared times r times frequency squared, you get centripetal acceleration to be 1.6 times 10 to the 6 meter per second squared. Of course, this would be toward the center of the circle. Part B asks why centrifuges need such a high frequency. This is to generate the greatest centrifugal acceleration as possible. Since we're separating the subjects by density, a greater centrifugal force will lead to greater separation of the substances by density. Again, this simulates the effects of gravity, as mentioned previously in the theoretical portion of this video. Part C asks, why do you think medical researchers want to separate particles? So the reason for this is because anytime medical researchers study a particle, they want it to be in pure form. You don't want it to be mixed with other particles. So that wraps it up for our Unit 1, which is all about dynamics. Stay tuned for our next video, where we're going to start Unit 2, which is energy and momentum. The first video will be on work done by constant force.